And welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the pre-admission game. Today, we're going to be talking about rural health MMI, the uh, well, basically the approach to any station that asks you to discuss rural health, be it in a public healthcare setting or sort of a medical practice uh, experience setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, as you're well aware, everyone, mm -hmm. uh, rural health is a concept that we have, you know, uniquely in Australia uh, because there is such a big disparity, I suppose, in the health between people who live in metropolitan settings versus people who live sort of out back or at, you know, in rural areas in Australia. Um, there's, there's this interesting quote that uh, you, you brought to light. <laughs> yeah. You were telling me about earlier. What's that, what's that quote? Yeah, so there's, there's a lo the specific logistic challenge that Australia encounters um, that perhaps many other countries don't encounter or have already overcome, and that's the tyranny of distance mm -hmm. um, in the sense that you might have a perfectly functioning society. You know, we have all of this wonderful technology, airplanes, trains, cars, mm -hmm. helicopters. We have a lot of dirt that people like to buy. A, a lot of, yeah, exactly. A lot of natural <laughs> very resources, very dirt. wealthy. But at the same time, we still haven't been effectively uh, effective enough at banding together and overcoming the challenges that are faced by our rural communities because they are just so far away from mm. uh, many of our centres of excellence, unfortunately. Yeah, right. Okay, so we've got some. We've got uh, apparently we have some rural health issues, um, and you've just touched on some distance from centres of excellence. What do you mean by a centre of excellence? First off. Yeah, of course. So a centre of excellence is this nice, uh, pretty pretentious word um, that we use refer to major hospitals that have many, many specialists um, that are leading in their fields, often affiliated with universities and professors, so sort of the cutting edge. So perhaps, you know, mm. in, in, if you go to Ballarat or Geelong or if you go to, you know, gosh, I don't know, somewhere like Cooper PD, you don't expect to find hospitals that are as big and as jam-packed with all of this different stuff. Um, as you otherwise would, though, you know, many of those examples that I listed are not like the others, you know, Ballarat is a, is a far cry from, from Cooper PD. Yeah, right. Very and, big but hospital, Ballarat yeah. would be still considered as a rural sort of regional health Probably, yeah, well. probably still a centre a center of excellence, I, I, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. so centre of excellence is this sort of arbitrary term. So yeah, they, amorphous, I, yeah. I suppose it means that they can, they can offer many sort of modalities of care for the patients if they have, you know, a really complex condition that needs you know specialist management and a full mm. multidisciplinary team now in in Australia we have like different tiers of rurality I suppose which you've sort of spoken about Aaron by by addressing uh, the fact that in Melbourne you know they are at the center then we have things that are further out you know for instance Ballarat and Victoria where you know it's an hour or two out of the city and then we have Cooper PD which um, I don't know. Is that they, do they main, mine opals? There yeah, they mine opals. They live on the ground. Yeah. There you go. I was thinking so, of uh, the most rural <laughs> setting I can think of. But you know, Mitch, you're absolutely right. We do have many tiers of rurality, I suppose, mm. in, in Australia. That's very important to recognise because um, when we think about rural healthcare in Australia, many doctors, many physicians don't actually consider. Victoria to have any rural areas at all like mm. we, we are pretty well we're quite a small state and we have a pretty good network of roads and pretty good network of referral hospitals throughout uh, if you go to Queensland that's a completely different story you go into you know inland Queensland they face mm. you know tyranny of distance challenges which are so much greater than anything that we have in Victoria yeah. maybe even more than they have in New South Wales the absolutely distances but, are enormous so I suppose when we when we say rural health you can't you know, paint all of rurality with the same brush. There is there is outback Australia that is so isolated that you need to take a two-hour flight in order to find it, um, you know, or, and then some, you know, and then there's the, the car trip that follows, you know, people talk mm. about sort of traveling in a ute for six hours to get to the airstrip to then get a flight to go to a, a major center where they yeah. can get care. Okay. So, you know, that's there's one end of the spectrum and then there's the, the two hours away from, mm. you know, a major center like Melbourne or Sydney yeah. and you, you you pop down to Melbourne and see your specialist and, yeah. and have your care. So it's essentially the difference between not having a second MRI machine and having maybe only one nurse staffing the entire, you know, Absolutely. health station. Yeah? Absolutely. It's a big, big margin. So, okay, we've, we've discussed that rurality is not, you know, so cut and dry. It can be lots of different things. Um, but there is some discrepancy in the healthcare that Australians are able to access. Is that right, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, of course, you know, the major problem is staffing. I, I think that's the easiest thing to discuss. There are less people that are willing, that are enthusiastic about working in Cooper PD, mm. right? Um, less specialists. Less opal 
um, you know, yeah, the, the opal that are also doctors. Exactly, the opal physician is, is a very ambitious crossover. I don't know if it's if it's been <laughs> properly explored by society. I mean, society. it seems like there's a medical specialty for everything, but there's no, <laughs> there's, there's no, there's no opal specialty yet. Um, no, opal specialty. But things are getting more competitive yeah. year on year, so exactly. maybe there will be a, a subspecialty in yeah. opals. Coming. Absolutely, and the thing is that if you're a specialist, you know, specialists are in rare supply. It's very difficult to become. Um, a specialist in anything. Right. And if you're a specialist in, in something, there's, um, well, first of all, you know, from your intellectual satisfaction point of view, you want to be involved in research. Uh, you want to be seeing as many different patients as possible. Mm. Um, you want to be seeing patients that only exclusively you can treat. Yeah, so, for right. example, you know, uh, there's a reason why if you have a little bit of a cut, you don't go straight to an orthopedic surgeon for the stitches. You know, that's something that a GP can do. Mm. So everything has to be skill set appropriate. Or a medical student in an emergency department. Just <laughs> <laughs> out of full force of the zingest damage. Yeah. So uh, it makes sense that, you know, again, Cooper PD or, you know, Alice Springs isn't, isn't filled to the brim with world-class so, um, so you've brought cardiothoracic up, surgeons, that's for right. example. So you've mm. brought up this really important issue of access, right? Mm. So they, a person who's in a rural area, if they are, you know, as you said, out in, in, in the, you know, the far bush, they are going to not have access to A, staff, um, you know, and expertise with that. So there may be doctors, there may be nurses, but they may not have the specialist knowledge and equipment out there to deal with whatever issues come their way. And it's really important that you touch on equipment because, of course, when the government spends millions and millions, billions of dollars building a new hospital, and it's very complicated stuff. It's not just the building and the equipment. There's a special architecture, special air vent system. It's, it's a whole you know, mm. public health uh, you know, uh, architecture crossover. Um, what the government wants to do is, of course, maximize the benefit that that hospital brings to the surroundings. So those hospitals naturally find themselves in mm. areas where there are lots of sick people, mm. where there's lots of people that need care. And inevitably, in the city, there are more people. And by virtue of there being more people in the city, there are more sick people. So you mm. might have a very unwell community somewhere in rural Australia, but there'll only be a couple of dozen people who are unwell. And that financially, when, when you know the bean counters do the maths, it doesn't justify building a massive tertiary center in there to cater these 24 people. That's right. right? That's right. So, so we, the equipment is, is a big, big and, one. And, and with that, so you, you have to imagine you're, you're rural and you've had a heart attack. Now, in, with certain conditions, time is of the essence and you need to be able to get to these centers of excellence, you know, in a rush, you know, within four hours for a heart attack. It's even shorter if it's a stroke or, you know, something else, God forbid. So the the point is you want to be close to these these a specialist that have this expertise and also this equipment and also you know other treatments and other things that you need so you know being rural is tough not just because being you know rural generally is tough and we'll touch on some of these things that are tough about being rural but generally you know you're you're just far away and isolated so they have much less access i want to paint this picture to you guys that you know people in rural areas have much less access to health care than we do in metropolitan cities um and that has a knock-on effect on their health overall. So what do we do then about this? Because, you know, I suppose as, as uh, problem solvers and, you know, healthcare practitioners in Australia, we, we need to address this inequity, you know, one of these, these injustices, which is the fact that in Australia, you don't have the same access to healthcare depending on your geographical location. So that's where you, um, you know, up and coming medical students <laughs> come in. You know, you're, you're, you will be asked with, about, you know, rural issues in Australia and how we could go about tackling some of these issues. Mm. So now that we've talked about the, the equipment and the people and the access, um, I think it's worthwhile talking about the situation perspective of the patient, mm. right? Um, now I have a little bit of experience with this because I've done a little bit of placement in, in rural Victoria, though by no means... Uh, you know, as I've said, Wangaratta's, which is where I did my placement, very lovely town and by no means as rural as Cuba PD, mm. but still not the same as, as, you know, rolling out of bed and finding yourself at, you know, any central metropolitan Melbourne hospital. Mm. So in these areas, you tend to naturally get a lot of farmers. A lot so of for context, yeah. for Wangaratta is something like four hours out four of Four hours, Melbourne, four, three, four hours yeah. outside Victoria. Look, it depends how fast you drive. <laughs> it depends okay, Aaron, how it'll take 10 hours. <laughs> take it sla safe, kids. Um, so in, in Wangaratta, right, you think about the demographic of people. So the demographic of people is very, very varied, but there's, you know, tend to be more farmers out in Wangaratta than mm -hmm. there are in, in central metropolitan Melbourne. 
And if you're a farmer, you own a big block of land, you might not live in you know, the center of Langorada. You might live on the peripheries of Langorada, mm-hmm. and it just might be your local town. So for you to get to a GP, you would have to drive to Wangaratta proper, which you know might be half an hour, might be twenty minutes, depending Could on where. Could be an hour and a half. Could be well, again, yeah, maybe maybe a very rural farmer in Wangaratta. Mm-hmm. But that same individual in in a rural farming community in Queensland, right? To get to a GP, that might be an hour's drive, mm-hmm. right? Or maybe yeah, the right. GP does local rounds. They get in their car and they drive around and see patients. But they might only come around, you know, once every few months. So let's say that you have a strange pain in your back, and you're a farmer, right? And you've been farming your entire life. And, you know, you're a little bit more resilient, a little bit more tough than, than the weak Quite office stoic. workers, yeah, yeah. Yeah. stoic individual, exactly. Um, she'll be right attitude. Exactly, she'll be right attitude, which in 99% of cases is fantastic. But in this case, you know, maybe you're in your late 70s, your late 80s, and you see a bit of back pain and it hasn't quite gone away. There's a lot of work to be done on the farm. And, you know, you're not going to get in the car in, in, in nearly as many situations and drive to see that GP an hour away as, you know, I would. You know, if I'm sitting on an office chair and I have a bit of a, you know, niggling pain in my back and I know that I want to ride my bike to, you know, to uni tomorrow, I'm going to go to see a physiotherapist because that's, you know, the environment in inner city Melbourne, not the environment in in these far rural communities. Mm. So this results in less interactions between the community and the healthcare practitioners. And that means, you know, the one in a million times when that back pain is something serious, you know, God forbid, some sort of cancer, it might not get picked up as quickly as it would in the city. Yeah. And right. you can imagine that that's a very serious problem with a serious disease. Things that are picked up later, inevitably harder to treat, mm-hmm. worse outcomes. So we, so I hope you're starting to see, guys at home, that you know, it, they, they tend to just not do as well. And as a result, you will see slightly lower life expectancies and sli- slightly higher comorbidities. In, in rural areas, and, and, and a lot of this can be attributed um, to the lack of access that they have to overall healthcare and their sort of less engagement. Now, we've, we've also touched on biopsychosocial issues as well, and there are some social determinants as well. You know, this Aaron was touching on, um, you know, the stoic attitude and the fact that people are less likely to complain. You know, perhaps there's lower health literacy generally in rural areas, you know, if we're talking about the, the farmer who's you know, just who has the she, should be right attitude compared to someone who could be, you know, an inner Melbourne hypochondriac, you know, hypochondriac, you know, looks Google. everything up yep. on Google compulsively, you know, that for better or for worse, they will have different um, health literacies, which will, you know, inevitably change the amount of um, health care that they seek. So, like, but it's not to paint with a broad brush. I mean, I'm sure there's people with a should be right attitude in the city, and there's people who are very perceptive of their health in the country, absolutely, and that's very absolutely. important to remember. In the interview, but we're talking about prevailing trends and patterns here, right? Mm, mm, mm. And I suppose as long as you you're able to sort of say, look, um, you know, th- this isn't by you know by any shape or form the 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 one size fits all approach, but it, it is it is something that seems to happen. It seems to be a bit of a trend, and so if from a public health standpoint, anyway, this is they they look at these issues as things that can be addressed. So we've talked about some of the challenges that come about from being in a rural area, namely the access. Um, and also some social determinants as well that have led to some, you know, slightly worse health outcomes. But there are also some advantages to being rural. And um, I suppose, Aaron, you, having been rural yourself um, on clinical placement, you'll be able to talk about some of that from a, a healthcare standpoint, and then we can touch on the, the patient standpoint as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've talked about how perhaps there are less specialists in the countryside. So inevitably, we return to this this model of medicine where you have to pick up the slack if you're a doctor in the country, right? So you, if you are in that position of, of healthcare um, practitioner, you have to treat things that would otherwise be delegated in the city, mm. right? Now, we actually saw a lot of this, um, you know, a few years back, maybe a couple of decades ago. Um, when GPs really dominated the landscape when it came to rural health. And when I say dominated, they still dominate it now. But, um, you know, you used to have GPs that were involved in anesthesiology, GPs that were involved in obstetrics, gynecology, and they would get additional training to supplement their general practice, but they would be able to fill, you know, multiple shoes, these multiple roles Mm. um, as needed in the community. And that sort of allowed us to not have, you know, an on-call, fully-fledged anesthesiologist covering a massive 
area, you know, bouncing between all of these communities and have a couple of well-trained generalists who are able to, to you know, put on different hats and, and work in different fields. Mm. Um, so when it comes to training in the rural environment, when it comes to practicing medicine in the rural environment, you essentially get to step outside of your comfort zone. You're still very safe and very supervised, but at the same time, you have to sort of, the buck stops with you. Mm, and if mm. the buck stops with you, you have to take responsibility and then, you know, read up and, and prepare and manage all sorts of different patients. And I suppose in many ways mm. that could make practicing medicine more fun in some ways because you're not, Certainly, you're less you're not doing the same thing over and over again. You know, if you're a specialist, you're, you know, excising skin lesions all day, every day, whereas, you know, this is a little bit of something one day, something completely different the next day. Mm. And like, I mean, if you turn every doctor into, into sort of a conveyor belt, if your only job is to excise a particular, you know, bit of skin, you'll be brilliant at it. Right? Mm. But from a professional satisfaction point of view, maybe not, not so great. Um, mm. But then again, you know, you expand the scope of practice. Maybe you do, you know, four or five things and you do them slightly less well, mm. but still very excellent standard of care. So it's a sort of the, the two competing models of generalism versus specialization. Absolutely. And I mean, I'd say that maybe working rurally as well could also be more satisfying in many ways. I mean, we talk about people using doctors in the city, you know, you, you wouldn't know who they are from anyone else, but you, you might, you know, see them once in the emergency department or something and then never see them again. You know, in, in a rural environment, and you'll be able to confirm that, it's a, you know, they're really a part of the community, a real, like, an intrinsic, um, you know, layer to the, old, to the whole community framework. And I mean, to, to be in that position in a community would be, would be a real privilege. And I can imagine, um, you know, people who want to get to know families, um, you know, in a really deep way and, and, and sort of see people grow up and really have that involvement with everyone from sort of day dot right to their sort of their, their final years would be would be something that would be really, um, you know, satisfying for a lot of people. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely encountered that. Like, I mean, with all of these uh, centers, it depends where you go. If you mm. have quite a large rural center like Bendigo, Ballarat, Wangaratta, it is quite a big catchment area. So mm. you do get people from far and wide, people passing through town. But there are also a lot of people who are local to the hospital. Um, and, and yeah, because the staff is smaller, there's a tighter community feel. And I think the improved, the, the closer relationship that you have with your healthcare provider mm. uh, probably allows for a better better standard of communication, better standard of, of health care. You know, it's one thing, you know, you walk into an office, doctor tells you to take some pills, you leave that office, and mm. you, you forget about the pills every third day. It's a completely different story if, if, you know, your friend, Dr. Jack, who, you know, you regularly see in the community, uh, told you that it would be better for your health to, you know, improve your your risk of cardiovascular mm. disease. That I, I think people will be much more receptive to that sort of attitude. Absolutely. Um, I suppose yeah. the flip side to that, though, is that you know, as a doctor, when do you get to switch off? When do you get to sort of unplug from the doctor role mm. in the community and get to just, you know, let your hair down? I mean, Absolutely. you you, you, have, you can't. That everything you do is on show, and you know, you are the doctor to them. You know, from the time you wake up to when you go to bed, you know, it doesn't matter if you're at work or not. Mm. Um, and you know, so you walk into the local pub and you see a patient that you treated a couple of weeks ago. That's right. You know, are you, are you still a doctor? Or are you, you know, average Joe Schmo at the pub? And as much as it might appeal to some of the listeners of this podcast to always have your your doctor hat on, it gets tired. It gets tiring. Absolutely. Most people find it tiring very, very quickly. And so, if you are, you know, if you are, if you are someone who's single, someone who wants to sort of start a family and things, you end up being around people who are all your patients and for many professional reasons that you know that can't be the case you can't be seeing your patients romantically so i say for many sort of young people um it's it's it becomes hard to unplug and to have that sort of double life where yes you're the doctor and yes you um have a certain role in the community um, but you also want to have you know your your own life as well and i think that becomes really hard for people to separate and i think that kind of adds to that issue of of access to healthcare, you know, we were t we touched on this earlier. This idea of distribution of healthcare workers, where there are less people who are willing to go rural, um, you know, for many reasons. Yep, yep, lifestyle reasons being some of those. Okay, so we've talked about what it's like from the doctor's perspective. Let's now have a chat about what it's like from the patient's perspective. What are some of the advantages to living a rural lifestyle? Mm. Um, first and foremost, the the most obvious advantage is, of course, your lifestyle is less sedentary. Right? You are not sitting in an office for the most part. You are more active. Um, you know, certainly if you're a farmer, you're more active. Um, certainly, you know, if you're much more exposed to big green open spaces, right, you're, you're less exposed to sort of the, the city culture, right? 
um, the, the built up concrete jungle type of environment, mm. um, you tend to have a more active lifestyle. Um, you know, that lifestyle isn't without its, without its diseases. You know, you have all, all sorts of issues to do with, you know, the crops that you farm and, and the cattle that you rear. But this is a, a general rule of thumb. Um, and there's a lot of physicality in that work, which is also, you know, doing wonders for your, your heart and your lungs. Um, anything to add to that, Mitch? Uh, just, just, I suppose the flip side of the coin would be that if you were a farmer that was working, you know, in a highly mechanised environment, then you wouldn't really sort of reap those benefits. And I think maybe more people, and this is, I suppose we're, we're, we're talking hypothetically here, but if you if you weren't, you know, exposed to that sort of super health conscious, you know, vegan, uh, vegetarian sort of craze that, that seems to be, you know, going around. Prevailing in the, in the city. city. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in the cities, you know, it seems like every second person, for whatever reason, is, um, you know, having a plant-based diet. Now everyone's very health conscious. And I wonder, you know, if that is is the case, you know, prevailing in rural environments or if it's more, you know, like the meat and two veg kind of, get the calories in sort of t- so you, to give you fuel to to do you know the, all the the physical things that mm. you were discussing it's actually very interesting because already we've exposed this sort of dichotomy where well i can certainly reflect on that if we compare even two different towns in rural victoria you might have one town full of sort of very active people and then you have another town which is rural and you know living costs in rural towns mm-hmm. are a little bit cheaper right so they tend to have people who are slightly low socioeconomic conditions like we've discussed in, in our previous podcast. Mm. And you might get this this congregation of people who by virtue of their social environment and by virtue of the fact, you know, the, the local restaurant in the town of is McDonald's and, mm. and you know, the, the lifestyle and the isolation and the lack of healthcare and healthcare education, you know, less universities, less uh, less high school options mm. when you move into those sort of areas, you, you might actually end up with the opposite effect. You might be, Absolutely. you know, in the beautiful countryside but end up suffering from all of the, the biopsychosocial tyrannies. Yeah. Um, but, and I mean, and you discussed, you brought up a good point about, you know, being in wide open green spaces and how, you know, that might produce a calming effect on you and things like that. But if, if you, on the flip side, consider potentially a farmer whose crops have failed this year. I know in Australia we have, you know, really extreme drought conditions sometimes. And if that if that happens to, to, to fall on your land for whatever reason, that's extremely stressful. I mean, people talk about needing, you know, the right to water a little patch around their, their house just to sort of improve their mental health because, um, you know, the feeling of being in an, a dry, arid environment is really, really hard on the human psyche. So I think many, um, you know, Farmers, I suppose, if we, if although there are many people in rural environments that are there for many different reasons, if we were to use a farmer as an example, um, you know, if being around dry, arid conditions and having your your business sort of not be as successful as you want it to be as a result of something that's out of your control, no matter how hard you till the land, you know, it's it's I think it's it's very difficult for many people mentally. So, it's it's not without you know struggles. Mm, certainly a challenge. Yeah. So it's very very dichotomous this picture. Mm. And it's certainly. A challenge. So I guess the the final part of this podcast, what Mitch and I would like to discuss, is how can we go about solving some of these rural challenges? Mm. What what are some of the programs that have been instituted? Um, so I guess I'm the recipient of, of one of those programs. Um, if you go back, you know, a, a couple of decades, I'm sure that this was a, a an issue that was still much more difficult to, to resolve. It was less discussed, probably. Mm. I imagine there was a smaller Australian population. This was less of an evident problem, um, but. Currently, most medical schools, in fact, most hospitals, offer rural rotations and rural training. And in fact, in many situations, rural training is uh, obligatory. People, you have to do at least some portion of your training Mm. rurally. And there's uh, a twofold benefit to this. First of all, people who otherwise wouldn't have experienced the country get to go into the country and, you know, they, they, you know, see if the shoe fits. Yeah. And they, they, like, they see if they, they like it, and hopefully they like it, and they, and they decide to come back and work in that environment because, you know, it really is for some people. Some people do really enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Um, the other advantage is if you keep rotating doctors through a particular rural area by, by obliging them to do so as part of their training, you're keeping that area well-staffed. And, you, you know, there is an increasing number of doctors that were training in Australia, and therefore an increased staffing in these regions. Um, Mitch, do you want to talk a little bit about... Um, programs that, that um, attract people from rural areas to go and study medicine as well? Yeah, well, I suppose um, 
to, to many of you that are interviewing now will know that you know there is a significant allocation in medical school for those that are you know from a rural background. Bit of a bonus. Yeah, uh, it's a massive bonus. I hear. <laughs> Bit of a massive bonus. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you know, congratulations to those of you who who have that bonus. And um, I suppose the idea of that is that um, people who originally come from you know rural environments are just seem to be at least by the government more likely to go rural um, and return to their community and and practice medicine there. and it, it makes sense right i grew up in melbourne i want to stay in melbourne if you grow up in shepherd and wangaratta it makes sense for you want to stay in those you areas want to go and you want to your, stay at home know, yeah absolutely absolutely so i mean uh, there, there's a lot of merit to that i mean and there's arguments either side i, I know plenty of people from metro who would want to go rural you know feel ripped off by that but th- it's just it's a government level intervention um, which is trying to address this health um, inequality due to access. Um, you know, other things that are being done are bringing the specialists to the farms, like to take them to, to the rural areas. So um, there's, I, I can't remember the name of the, the truck, but they're taking... Oh, the Heart of Australia. The, the Heart of Australia, that's about, what I'm thinking. Yeah. So, so, you know, there, there's cardiology clinics that are out in, in the bush. There's also similarly... These massive semi-trailer trucks driving around and giving people heart checkups. Uh, so, where they otherwise wouldn't have had access to them. Yeah, and then and similarly, there's people um, who have organised dialysis trucks to do a similar thing, where they uh, go and help, um, particularly First Nations people with um, who need dialysis. You know, who otherwise wouldn't want to travel to the main sort of metropolitan centres or regional centres to receive dialysis treatment. Um, so there's many things that are being done to try to address this access issue. And then you can also think of the maybe less obvious points, but building roads, improving infrastructure. Um, building train lines, um, improving air access to particular areas, so helicopter landing pads, all of these things are actually inadvertently improving access. Because mm. if you have to travel 50k down a dirt road, you're not going to do that in your specialist Lexus, right? Yeah, you, if you need to hire a four-wheel drive to make a particular, a particular trip, that's a barrier. There's a nice paved road that takes you directly where you need to go, you know, but either you going access at all times at of the, all year. Times of the yeah. year, exactly. That doesn't flood, that doesn't break down. Mm. Completely different story. Absolutely. There's a landing strip where the Royal Flying Doctor Service can land mm. in times of need safely, right? Suddenly you have air access to a particular area. Suddenly if somebody feels unwell, you can evacuate them effectively. Out and, of we, and we were discussing the idea of, you know, someone traveling six hours in order to get to a landing strip, in order to get away. You know, it, it just, it makes, far better sense to be able to, you know, allow the plan, plane to land closer Come to, to you, this person's yeah. house. Yeah, yeah exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, it's very much, um, and, and you know, there, there's other, other minor projects like, you know, they get medical students to speak and, and doctors to speak to school kids from those areas. There's a lot of information exchanged, uh, health education. Mm-hmm. So it's a very multifaceted program. And I'm sure if you <laughs> spent a quick 15 minutes Googling it, you would find an inexhaustive list of, of many, many policies that have been implemented mm-hmm. in order to alleviate this, this growing concern that we have as, as a healthcare community Absolutely. in Australia. So I suppose in summary, like the, the biggest takeaway today is to understand that the main issue for rural health is an issue of access. And once you take that sort of, uh, you know, that, that pin of access being the key issue, you all of a sudden can, can, can draw many other issues off that, that central issue. Sort of like a mind map. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that, that should give you a great framework for your, for your answer mm. in the MMI. Absolutely. Well, guys, um, thanks you, thank you for listening in. We tried to keep this one short and sweet. I think <laughs> good change from our previous long-form episodes. Um, yeah, tune in for more episodes of the pre-admission game coming up next. Absolutely, and all the best with your MMI preparation.